Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome to the first of our, uh, what we're calling Bible school. Uh, just want to really just uh, cover the fundamentals of the faith. I know people are watching online and um, that's really good. So um, right at the beginning, can we just pray together? Just ask God to help us. Uh, if you're here in the room, we're glad. Get your Bibles out, get your notepads out. And I'm sure that we're going to have some uh, great times together. Let's just pray. Father, we just want to thank you that we have this opportunity in the middle of the week just to come around your word. And I pray, Lord, as we just look at the Bible together tonight, that, Father, faith will rise in our hearts. Lord, we don't want your word just to be a book. Father, we know it's more than a book. It's living and it's active and it's powerful. And we want you to change our lives forever. So we pray that you just bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So over these next few weeks, every other week, we're going to be doing Bible school together. And uh, for the first six of those sessions, I'm going to be covering the fundamentals of the Christian faith, which is really important for us all just to grasp. Whether you've been a Christian for a long time or whether you're new to church, it's good to remind ourselves of what the Bible teaches us and what we believe about God. So uh, tonight, I'm going to teach you about three things because it, but it matters what we believe. It really does matter what we believe. We can believe a lie, but we are those today that trust in God's word and trust in what he said. So I'm going to teach you about three things today. We're going to look about who God says he is, about himself. We're going to look at the Bible and why we believe it's God's word. And then we're going to look at what's happened to humanity. And then we're going to start to build. So it's almost like I'm building from ground zero. So every week we get here, we're going to put a brick on a brick on a brick until you understand really what our faith is all about. And so I'm really excited about that. So um, we are those today that call ourselves believers. Would you say in the room, you're a believer today? You're a believer. We're a believer because we believe. Now, not everybody believes, do they? Some people would say they are atheists. I've not really met any real atheists because actually, you know, I've done some funeral visits. You've knocked on somebody's door and they come in and go, we've only had a vicar because my mum wanted a vicar and we don't believe in God. And at the end, when they've talked all about mom and her life and I'll say, do you mind if I pray? They go, yeah, pray for me. Because really, everybody wants to believe in something. Whether they, whether they think it's God or not, there is a desire in man, which we're going to talk about in a moment, for God to be part of their lives. So they would call themselves atheists and they'll rally up and down, there is no God, there's no proof of God. And yet they struggle because everybody struggles to want to believe and to belong somewhere. And then they're what called agnostics, they're those that just don't know. There's a lot of people, probably you work with, go to school with, whatever, that just don't know about God and about Jesus, about anything else. And so the atheists are in a really sticky position, those that say they don't believe at all. Because then you look at what's around us, you look at our world, look at everything that there is and go, where's all that come from then? If there's no creator, if there's no God in heaven, Where's all this stuff come from? Where, where, where's this earth come from? Where the stars come from? Where? And so they have created a theory, and they call it the Big Bang. Right, millions and millions of years ago, all of these gases exploded, and in the explosion of these gases, suddenly things began to develop and evolve. And everything that you see here today, the carpets, the chairs, the lectern, you, me, we all came from a random act some millions of years ago. Now, I don't know about you, anybody got a garage here? Right, I tell you what, my garage is full of random stuff. Uh, you ever been in my garage, there's tools that are in the wrong place. There's the garden stuff in the wrong place. There's hose pipes. There's loads of the kids' toys that we should have put on eBay but haven't yet. All of that stuff is there. Right, but I will tell you one thing. I will promise you this. If I open that garage door tomorrow morning and throw in a hand grenade, it's not going to be any tidier. That explosion is not going to put that stuff into order. In fact, you know, when you talk about something exploding millions of years ago and creating everything, you might as well just say, I'm just about to throw a hand grenade into Steve's garage and all the random stuff in there is suddenly going to turn into a Mercedes that is fully working and full of petrol. Isn't it stupid how people think to themselves that everything that they see, everything that is working so perfectly, their, their bodies, their eyes, just think about the interests of our bodies right for a moment, that suddenly that came from nowhere. That's absolutely 
doesn't make any logical sense. There was a big bang right at the beginning of time because God said, let there be light. And the light just exploded and millions and millions and millions of stars just came into being. That's what the Bible teaches us. So yeah, there definitely was a big bang and there was probably a lot of gas involved in it, but it didn't come from some random act. It came from a creator God. That's what we believe in church. We believe in God who creates the heavens and the earth. He formed it, the Bible says. The universe was formed at his command so that which is made out of what was invisible. Hebrews 11 and verse 3. So if you're taking notes, Hebrews 11 verse 3. God created everything. That's what the Bible tells us. In the beginning, God spoke. You know, we, people sometimes say, well, you know, where's God come from? Listen, the Bible never explains where he comes from. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, which is the first verse and the first chapter in the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God. He doesn't explain where he came from. He doesn't say where he came from. He doesn't need to explain where he came from. He's God and he's created all things by the power of his word. That's what the Bible tells us. And, you know, you can reinforce this as well. Just think about the design and the order and the universal laws that are in place. Just think for a moment about space. You know, we've just recently on a cruise and I watched them waves coming in and out. Those waves are controlled by the, the moon. Who, who made that happen? How, how come them waves know how to come in and out? How come the seasons know they're a season and one season merges into another? How come the, how come the world spins on its axis and doesn't fall? How, how do these things happen? They were designed that way. They weren't random. I tell you, if I throw a grenade into my shed, there's not going to come a lawnmower or come out working perfectly. It's going to be in bits. God did not create something that was imperfect everything he's created he put his hand upon and, you, and then you think about it look at yourself get a microscope out think about the dna that's in your body every little element that works together so perfectly if you ever sit down with a doctor or a consultant and they talk about how your body works that was not a random act the bible says that we were created by god and by his holy spirit we were planned and designed and therefore, the people who don't believe have got a big problem because they know that things work according to law. They know that things are designed to work. So they can't give us an answer, but the Bible gives us an answer. The Bible says, Romans 1 and verse 20, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. What the book of Romans is telling us is when you look at the complexity of this world, you've got no excuse but to believe. Let me just, get, just go with me a little moment. Look at the sea. Look at the ecosystems in the rainforest. Look at the complexity of the human body. And then tell me, honestly tell me, and look me in the eyes, that was some cosmic accident. Absolutely no way. God who made the heavens and the earth, created it all. And you say, well, how about evolution then? Because we go to school, the teachers about evolution. Now, I'm going to shock you now, because I believe in evolution. I've been to Crufts. I've seen them dogs. Some of them dogs have definitely been bred and been in an environment. There's big dogs, small dogs, hairy dogs, short dogs, fat dogs. Have you ever been to Crufts? Oh, there's kennel after kennel after kennel, different sorts of dogs. But you know one thing, they're all dogs. I believe that God created the species and things do evolve within that arena, but they don't evolve outside of that arena. There has never, ever been found any missing links. You see, they, they, they say, oh, well, the, uh, the newts, they, they, they became birds. So Norman the newt decides to climb the mountain. He looks over the top and he says to Norma, Norma Newt, his wife, I think I'll, I'll, think I'll fly today. Two billion newts later, they're soaring in the sky. It does not work because dogs are dogs and cats are cats and elephants are elephants and men 
and women or men and women because the Bible tells us that God created them, each and every one of them, and he called them by name. Just think about your own humanity right now. Just think about the whole thing about being created and about being so different from the animals. You know, some people say, oh, we, we came from monkeys. Well, looking at some people, you would probably believe they came from monkeys, but I, I actually believe that God created humanity different. We have personalities. Now, I know that sometimes you say, oh, well, my dog's got personality, but I'm talking about the complexity of our inside person. We can make intelligent choices. I know the animals can do that. We can distinguish between right and wrong. We're actually capable of love and compassion. And you know what? We, we're the only animals that can talk. I did a funeral visit and there was a minor bird in the corner and it used some really bad language. And I thought to myself, that, part, that minor bird wants shutting up. But he wasn't talking, he was just mimicking. He could not have a conversation with me he used some very blue language, but he couldn't hold a decent conversation with me because he couldn't talk. The Bible says that he created man in his own image, and the original words in there, he created man a speaking spirit, just like himself. We have an inner man that's been created by God, and we're able to communicate. So, and we have this instinct that says, we want something in our life that's beyond us. Where did we get these qualities from? The Bible says God created man in his own image, Genesis 1, 27. And you know what Psalm 139 says this, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. We weren't randomly evolved. We didn't come out some, some pile of gases and some amoebas somewhere. The God of heaven and earth created humanity. He created you and me. And the Bible says before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you. He put your personality in you. He's got his hand upon you. And he loves us tonight with all of his heart. Now, the Encyclopedia of Religious Ethics lists a hundred ways that men have tried to satisfy these religious feelings. The great evangelist Billy Graham put it this way. There's a God-shaped hole in every one of us that only God can fulfill. But men have tried to fill it with other stuff, haven't they? Throughout the centuries, throughout the time of humanity, they've worshipped the sun and the moon the stars and the earth, the fire and the water. They've made idols of stone and metal. They've worshipped fish and birds. Some people even worship cows, think they're sacred. But there's a desire in all of mankind to worship. And, you know, the Bible says that we have, they have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the created. So I want to say right at the beginning, because I'm just trying to lay a foundation as we get into this, We'll be doing more turning on the Bible, more writing notes, more talking about things together. And after we drop the live feed, I'm happy to take questions. But the truth is, the first thing you have to establish if you are a believer in God is that he made you, he created you, and you belong to him. Really, really important. That it wasn't some random act. And that's where people get really, really, really caught up and frustrated and destroyed. Because... If you don't believe there is a God, then your life is without purpose. If you don't believe God created you, then you can just do what you like, say what you like, and go where you like, because it doesn't matter. It does matter. And maybe tonight you're watching on live stream and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to tell you, he loves you with all of your heart, his heart. And he created you. He created you. And, and so God created us. So that's the first thing. So we're laying the foundations here. God created us. We either believe it or we don't. But I'll tell you what, the evidence for me is just outstanding. You know, a lot of people say, well, the science says this and science says that. I'll tell you again, if you throw a grenade into my garage, you are not going to get a Mercedes with, a, you know, with spoilers and, and full of petrol. You're just not going to do it because explosions do not create, they destroy. What happened in the beginning is that God spoke and creation was made. Amazing. So we just need to put that right into our hearts right at the beginning. And then I want to talk a little bit about God's word because, again, as we come to Bible school, the most important thing that we have, apart from the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us, is God's word and the Bible that we hold in our hands. 
And uh, as we communicate with each other, we, we use words. I know some of you use gesticulations as well, but now you're saved, you start doing that because that's not good. But the way we communicate with each other is to talk, to share, to converse. And God wants to do that with us and by his Holy Spirit and through his word, that's exactly what he does. He gives us this ability to be able to hear his voice. And um, the Bible, 4,000 times in the first 39 books, that's the Old Testament. The Bible is split into two. You've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're not two different books. They're the same book. They're the same book. God's word has not changed. The stuff that's written in the Old Testament has not changed. The New Testament is the fulfillment of everything that was written before it. It's one book written by lots and lots of people as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we're those that believe in the Bible. But 4,000 times in those first 39 books, you read words like this. The Lord spoke. God said. The Lord commanded. And the New Testament in 2 Peter 1 and 21 says that the Holy Spirit enabled men to, they were moved along and carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote the Bible. The Bible is not just some kind of textbook it's not some kind of history book it's not some kind of poetry book it's a living breathing word of God and you know that to be true and I know that to be true you're sitting here in Bible school tonight and many of you have just recently come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior but when you read the Bible it's not like reading the sun or it's not like reading a, 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 a book you've got at the library when you read the Bible God speaks to you God touches you and God changes you. And this is really, really important. This is God's word. And then throughout God's word, right from the beginning, God begins to talk to us and begins to show the people about what he's going to do, how Jesus is going to come. So all of these prophecies came forth and they were, they were spoken at different times by different sorts of people. Some were educated people. Some were people who God raised up. Some were shepherds like David. But God used a whole lot of people to write the Bible. But every one of those prophecies all dovetailed together in such a way that it would be impossible for that to be a forgery. Again, it's not a random book. It wasn't like somebody thought, I'll tell you what, we'll stick all the books of the Bible together and see if it makes any sense. Now the Bible speaks. And the way you interpret the Bible is by using the Bible to interpret the Bible. You don't go around to it and say, oh, I think I can work this out myself. No, if you want to ask the Bible a question, the Bible will always give you an answer. And God is speaking always through his word. There's been lots of literature written, but nothing like the Bible. You know what the, the 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 16 says this, all scripture is God-breathed. It wasn't man-made, it was God-breathed. God touched people's hearts, and as he touched their hearts, they begin to write what he said. And all over the world and down the years, those that have clung to the Bible have found God to be true and have had their lives totally transformed by the power of his word. And uh, the, those that have said they believe the Bible, but they sadly have interpreted the Bible by church traditions. I don't care what the denomination says. I don't care what the church will say or so-and-so says or the Methodists say. What matters to us in this church is what does the Bible say? Because it's not about the bells and the smells and the rituals. All of those things might have some significance, but this word has all authority. It's not about do, do I like it or don't I like it? Do I feel comfortable here or don't I feel comfortable here? The question is, am I trusting God's word? Because God's word is going to change me. And uh, sometimes, and you'll see it in the cults as well, because the Christian faith is a fantastic faith, but people have hijacked it. So you've got the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they'll put their spin on it. Instead of telling you what the Bible says, they will tell you what their leaders say about what the Bible says. And even in the Roman Catholic Church, sometimes the Pope will make pronouncements. It doesn't matter what the Pope says, but it matters what God says. Because leaders are fallible. Test out what I say up here. 
Go to the Bible and ask, this, ask the questions for yourself. It's important as believers that we believe God's word and we let it change us. And people have just got shipwrecked, absolutely shipwrecked, because they have just taken somebody else's word for God's word. Listen, I believe in preaching. I believe there's some great preachers and Bible teachers. But by the same token, get in your bedroom, open the book, and let God speak to you. It's imperative. It's part of your responsibility as a Christian. And you know what the Lord said? He said, my sheep hear my voice. Sometimes you hear a preacher say something, you go, I didn't, I didn't feel that was quite right. Well, maybe that's just the Holy Spirit telling you, actually, he's not right. He's just an idiot. Just forget that bit. And sometimes you have to eat the chicken and spit out the bones. But always stick to God's word. It's our sole authority. But even worse, in this generation, unfortunately, and that's why there's so many of the major denominations caving in right now and church is empty, is we've tried to make God's word relevant to our modern day generation. And I'm not going to use the word woke because I don't really like it. But you know what I mean when I say people are trying to make things politically correct. The Bible has not changed. God's word has not changed. It's eternally settled in heaven forever. So if the whole world is screaming, no, that's right, and the Bible says it's wrong, you know what? It's wrong. And that's tricky, especially when we're in a society that squeezes us into its mould and in the education system, and we've got teachers here tonight, and they'll say this, you know, and, and, and in the workplace, if you work in a corporate uh, situation, they want you to go along with what is, the world is saying, what everybody's agreeing to. But listen, it's what God's word says that counts. And we are those in this church that believe the Bible from cover to cover. And you stand on the truth, because you know what, at the end of the day, the truth will always set you free. And you will see in every generation, everybody changes their opinion anyway. That's why democracy is just ridiculous. It only proves that all the fools are on the same side. Just because everybody says it doesn't mean to say that it's right. But when God says it, you can take it to the bank and you can build your life on it. And I've often said from this pulpit, Jesus tells an incredible story about how to build our lives. He talks about two builders that go out and they both build. We're all building with something. We're all building something in our lives and they both build. One builds on the rock, which is God's word, and one builds on the sand, which is their own thinking. And then everybody goes through storms. If you're a Christian, you'll go through some hard times. If you're not a Christian, you'll go through some hard times. It doesn't keep us from going through the stuff that everybody else goes through. But what happens when the storm comes, if you build your life upon God's word, the Bible says that that, that house did not fall, it did not crumble, but the house that was built on the sand, it just crumbled into the sand and it was no more. And so many people in our world do not know what to believe. They are shaken at every given moment. Sometimes somebody will come up with a new theory. Everybody will jump on it and they'll get confused. I'm glad today that, you know, when I wake up in the morning, my trust is in God and in his word. It's really, really important. It's nothing about cultural relevance. It's all about God's truth. The Bible says in 2 Timothy that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. And in, to the church in Corinth, Paul says this, don't go beyond what was written. In Thessalonians it says, test everything and hold on to what is good. We need to be those that love the Bible and it's part of our daily walk with God. We need to read it, we need to listen to it, we need to get it taught to us and more than anything else, we need to obey it because all the great things God says in his word will not affect your life until you put them into action. The Bible says that faith without works is useless, it's dead. And the Bible says also that faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word. He also says without faith it's impossible to believe, please God. So as we get into a, his word, we begin to become full of faith. We become full of faith and trust in God. He smiles upon us and he blesses us. That's how it works. It's impossible to please God without faith. 
It's impossible to please my wife without faith either or anybody else you love because if you love somebody, you trust them. If you love somebody, you'll do what they ask you to do because you trust them. They, they, you know that they're not going to let you down. I can tell you now, God speaks to us through his word and he will never let you down. His word is so powerful in our hearts and in our lives. It's transformational. It's alive. There's no other book like it on any level. The Bible says about itself, it says the word of God is like a two-edged sword. You know, I, I, I like reading novels. I like reading sort of stuff, John Grisham, all that kind of stuff, sitting on my sun lounger reading all of that stuff. And, and it amuses me and it entertains me, but it never changes me. But I will guarantee you when I am open to God and open that Bible, that something of his presence and something of his blessing changes me from the inside out. The Bible is the most important book ever written because it's not just a book. It's the word of God. Okay? So God created us. He's speaking to us. So where did it all start to go all so wrong? Well, the Bible talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. And when he created the heavens and the earth and he, and he, he made the stars and the, the sea and the sky and the animals, he finally decided that now... I want to put something at the top of this creation that I can have a relationship. I'm going to create a man and he's going to be just like me. He's going to be a speaking spirit. He's going to be my friend. I'm going to walk with him. And we're right at the beginning in the book of Genesis. Incredible book. The book of Genesis is very, very important because it's the seedbed of everything that comes after. So it's really important. Some people read Genesis, oh, these are full of nice stories. No, no, this has been the beginning of what God is saying. So right at the beginning, God creates man and woman. And God looks at this man and this woman and he goes, they're really good. What I've created up so far was good, but this is really good. And that's in Genesis 1, verse 31. So in the first few verses, God's saying, I've created man, it's really good. And then you skip on a couple of chapters to Genesis 6. And he says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth. Because his every inclination and thought of his heart was evil all the time. So what happened between the very good and they're all terrible? Something clearly happened. And we read it, don't we? We read it in the book of Genesis. Something did happen. What happened is that God loved Adam and Eve. But he said, look, I, I want you to do what I ask you to do. And then they were tempted by the devil. And they're being tempted by the devil. Now, listen. You're looking at me now, some of you, but listen, we are those in this church that believe in the enemy. There are churches that have just gone away from saying that hell is real and that the devil's not real and, and it's, it, that none of that really matters and it's all figurative. No, the Bible tells us it's real. And we know it's real because when Adam and Eve gave into the temptation from the devil, something radically changed. Romans 5 and verse 12. Sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin. Something happened. There was a complete change from God's relationship with man. All of a sudden he's saying everything he does is wicked. And the thing was that man rebelled against God and did it his own way. And the first man and woman lived in perfect environment, in perfect harmony with each other and with God in communion. And then this temptation comes at this point, sin enters the world. And instead of having that wonderful relationship that they used to have with God, they're now terrified of him. Now, I'm going to tell you one of my jokes because my wife is not here to point the finger tonight. So there was a pastor and uh, he just started pastoring this church and he thought, I better visit everybody. So he gets a list of all the members and he's, he's visited everybody apart from this one lady who he's, he's never been able to catch her at church and he says to her one Sunday morning I need to come and see you this week she said okay she said come and see me then anytime doesn't matter and so he finds a house and uh, the lights are on but he keeps knocking the door the lights are on but nobody's at home by the look of it so he gets a little card out of his uh, out of his bag and he wrote writes this he says I think th he tries to be funny so he writes revelation 320 behold I stand at the door and knock puts it through the woman's door the next week in church, she comes up to him a little bit sheepish and she passes him a card, which he puts in his pocket. He stands up, starts the service. When he gets back home, he says to his wife, he says, Sheila, Sheila gave me a little card. I wonder what she wrote on it. And she wrote on it, Genesis 3.10. I heard the sound of you in the garden. 
And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. <laughs> but that's exactly how it was. God was in this great relationship with Adam and Eve, and then all of a sudden they found themselves naked and wanting and just so far from God. And instead of being assured and confident and happy, that their sin had made them suddenly guilty and ashamed and afraid. And I'm not going to jump ahead of where I'm going to get to the next time, but I want to tell you this. Jesus has rescued that relationship, so don't worry about it. We're talking about sin tonight and how man fell, but I tell you what, there is a remedy, and his name is Jesus, and that relationship that we had that was broken has been totally restored. And if you're here tonight or you're watching online and you feel guilty and you feel ashamed and you feel broken and you feel let down, I want to tell you the answer to all of that is Jesus. He'll put you back together again because we've all sinned that's what the bible says we've all sinned you know it's like it's almost like from adam's sin there came like a polluted river throughout out of mankind and we all know in our heart of hearts there's none of us perfect if you're perfect tonight just just fly around the room a couple of times and sit back on your chair for me would you because we all know that none of us are perfect the bible says that not we're all sinners every one of us and you kind of look at the to newspaper today and the television and the radio and the headlines and we all know one thing. Humanity is in a mess. The world is in a mess because man is in a mess. We talk about, oh, well, this happened. That, no. Listen, it's us that's polluted this planet. It's us that's done the things that have destroyed so much. God is wanting to build us again. And it's so easy, really, isn't it, to condemn everybody else. You know, oh, look at that country. Look at that over there. Saw they're all their fault. What's happening in that country? They, they're only reaping what they've sown. And we start pointing the finger at other people. But actually, if we were honest, all of us tonight, we've all fallen short of God's glory. I've said this so many times from here, but if God put your sins up from the last two weeks on that screen, just the last two weeks, everybody would be out that door. Nobody would want to stay here. Because we all know that we do things wrong, we say things wrong, we think things wrong. Because we all have fallen short of God's glory. And sin is serious because it separates us from God. See, what it doesn't mean, because we all say, oh, we're all sinners. What it doesn't mean is that we're all nasty. It doesn't mean that we all mess up all of the time. I know some lovely, lovely people. They're still sinners, but they're lovely people. They do good. They take care of people. But it's not about that, is it? Because we know on the inside of us that we're all still broken. We can mask it. We can do stuff. Sin has invaded every part of our nature, our personality, our mind, our will, our affections, our consciousness, and our imagination. And we know in our heart of hearts, the best that we can do, we still mess it up. In fact... Isaiah says in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Anything that we think we can do ourselves, when it boils down to it, is never good enough. Never good enough. And we talk a lot, and again, I'm conscious because we need to pray for our young people in the education system. Some of you may have seen what's happening at Beacon Hill, they've, they've had the TV cameras in, it's been shown on the telly. And, and you look at some of these young people, and they're broken young people. But, but the issue here is, and I'm not, I'm not decrying mental health, because mental health is serious. And as, as Christians, we need to address these things and pray for people and love people and make sure they get the right sort of help. But there's a whole thing around, was it nature that caused them to be like this, or was it nurture? Were they born into a bad family or did they fall in with a gang that t turned to be like this or not? The truth is, no. <laughs> the Bible says we're sinners. It's not what we do, it's who actually we are. And so, when we point the finger at somebody that's hurt and broken, we might as well just point the finger straight back at ourselves because, let's be honest with you, we're all in the same boat. That's why the gospel is so powerful, because it's not for good people or for bad people. It's for everybody. And then when people come in this church and they're broken and hurt and disappointed and, and, and in a right state, 
it'd be so easy for some of us to puff out our chest to go, well, I, I was never like that. Oh, you were. You just didn't act out what you thought in your brain. We have thought some stuff. Some of us just never done it. Because that's the truth. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The trouble is not what we do, but who we are. The Bible sums it up like this. It says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Our hearts were wrong. Our attitude's been wrong. And Jesus says, from within men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. That's in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, 21 and 22. Notice it includes our thoughts and our words and our actions. See, we, all, we like to point the people, finger at people that do stuff bad. But sometimes we think stuff bad. And we get angry on the inside. My sister's got this saying that to, to one of her daughters, my, one of my nieces. She says, I wish you'd just tell me to my faith instead of sticking the two fingers up in her head. Have you ever been like that? Like, you, you thought it in your head. You just not said it with your mouth. And the truth is the whole of the world is exactly the same. You, you can go to any country in any part of the world. You can talk to any person that's ever lived. And we're all the same because we're all are sinners needing a saviour. We all need to face up to this. From The book of Proverbs says this, Who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Who can say that? Not the pastor. <laughs> if only. No. No. I mean, even though we don't think so, before we know Jesus, we just... We want to do our own thing. And even when we come to know Jesus, we still want to do our own thing because it's still our nature. We still want to get on and do what we want to do and say what we want to say and live how we want to live. But we need to know tonight, and, and this is why I believe our church is going to grow and lives are going to be transformed because we don't want to pussyfoot around the truth. You start, start backpedaling and telling everybody they're, they're good and all right. and this, that, that. No. We have to understand that, that sin is a barrier that keeps us from God and that sin has to be dealt with one way or the other. Now, in a small way, sin does pay wages. The Bible says that sin pays wages. So if you, if you want to abuse yourself with alcohol for 25, 30 years, you, you'll probably find out you get cirrhosis of the liver because that, that thing does pay consequences. But it's not that I'm talking about. Because some people get away with it or seem to get away with it, don't they? I did a funeral once for an old guy. He was 99. 99. And his granddaughter stood with me at the graveside. And as they lowered the coffin, she said, he got away with it, you know. I said, well, she said, he's 99. And he's drunk eight pints of Banks' mold since the day he was 14, every day. So he seems to have got away with it. So, oh, well, and the, the, David says that. He says, hey, hey, it seems that the evil, seem to get, the evil people seem to get away with it and the good people seem to always be in trouble. Well, I'll tell you something. God is going to deal with sin. He's dealt with this punishment of sin for us who accept him, but for those who choose to reject him, there is a day of judgment coming. In the book of Jude, which is a little book in the New Testament, chapter 1, 14 to 15, Jude says this, See, the Lord is coming with thousands and thousands of his holy ones, to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and all the harsh words ungodly sinners have ever spoken against him. There is a day of judgment coming. Some churches don't like to preach that because then that scares people. How about if people are offended? I'd rather you be offended and find Jesus than not offended and think that you're okay. And then one day stand before him and say, why didn't the preacher tell me the truth? We choose to preach the truth of the gospel here. The Apostle Paul takes the time out to explain again. He says, when the Lord Jesus is ruled from heaven in a blazing fire with his power of all angels, he will punish those that do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we need to understand that. We need to understand that God is going to deal with sin. But the great news, and it will be on it the next time, is for us that know our Lord Jesus Christ, 
All of our sin that was like filthy rags, all of our blackness and darkness has been completely washed away. And when God looks at me and you tonight, he does not see the sin. He sees Jesus. He sees that wonderful robe that he's put upon us, that robe of righteousness that that we did not deserve, that Christ paid for on the cross. And we are totally free. I can go to heaven tonight. I can die and go to heaven tonight. And as the old hymn said, boldly approach God's throne. I won't be carrying the corner thinking, does he love me? Does he hate me? What's going to happen when I get there? Is he going to sort me out? When I get there, I'm going to look at Jesus and he's going to look at me. And I'll say, that's my saviour. And he's going to say, that's my son. Come on, Steve. This is the truth. This is what believers believe. Some churches will try and tell you, you can polish yourself up and be better. They lie. We've been saying it for weeks now, but in this church, it's Jesus plus nothing. That's the only way. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except they come through me. You can't get to God any other way. You can get on your knees and crawl 12 miles up a hill and kiss a cross and polish Mary with your special rag or whatever some people do. You can roll around on the floor, you can fast, you can... None of that will save your soul. We used to sing an old song, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's important because I I know Sunday we don't have the time that I'd like to teach the word. Like That's why we brought Bible school back. And we're not going to try to wear everybody out by doing it every week. But every other week we are going to take these things and we're going to make sure that you fully understand the truth of the gospel. Because it's important. Because we're in a world that is screaming all sorts of stupidity at us. But you know when you wake up tomorrow morning I want you to wake up and, 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 and throw off the covers and go, Jesus loves me. I'm clean, I'm set free, I don't have to walk that way anymore, he loves me, I'm loved of him, I'm going to heaven, he's going to look after me, as Claw says very often, he's got me in the palm of his hands, he's never going to leave me, he's never going to forsake me. This is really, really important that we get these things deep into our hearts. So that's where we find ourselves tonight in Bible school, uh, that God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that, don't we? You're not here as some randomer. I want to say this, and I really feel online and maybe in the house, is that sometimes people have said to you, you weren't wanted. You you, you were just a mistake. I want to say very clearly, none of you were ever a mistake. God knew. Your parents might not have wanted you. But God knew, and before you were even formed, before you were even a twinkle in your father's eye, before you were an embryo in your mother's womb, he knew you. He knew you. Some people get so just disillusioned, and and that's when when you you try to tell, tell people they evolved from animals, they start to behave like animals. I wasn't evolved from an ape. I was created in the image of God. I don't have to crawl around like the rest of me in the dirt. I can lift my head up because he has set me free. Isn't this amazing tonight? He has set us free. I know the sun sets free. We've been saying he's free indeed. Free indeed. So God created the heavens and the earth and he created you and he created me. And he gave us his word. And he spoke through prophets and he spoke through kings and he spoke through poets and he spoke through wise men and he spoke through some ordinary men. And that group of writings and that book that we have is God's word. And by his Holy Spirit, he just illuminates us and it's important. So that's why we call it Bible school, because we believe the Bible. Now, if you start sawing bits off and sticking bits in, you're going to lose out a whole lot of good stuff. We stick to God's word plus nothing. And then we've just looked at the fact that All of us are sinners, needing a saviour. But the next time we'll find out that job has been done completely and we've been born again by his Holy Spirit. I just want us to pray. Maybe you've never committed your life to the Lord. 
If you want to pray with me right now, that would be good. Maybe, you, you, maybe you've just thought about yourself. I, it's important, again, what you believe about yourself in the light of God's word. If you've ever said these words about, I, I am nothing, don't say that anymore. You are something. You're somebody that Jesus loves enough to have died for. Oh, I wasn't wanted. You were wanted. You were wanted by God. Oh, well, my, my life will never amount to anything because I'm nothing. You, you are something. You're very precious to God. So I'm going to pray a prayer. You want to respond to that. That's brilliant. Maybe you're online. And, uh, and, and when I'm going to, after I've prayed that, I'm going to pray as well because what happened when, when sin entered into this world, sickness came with it and all the other stuff. And maybe you just need a touch in your body from the Lord tonight. I want to pray, pray over that. And then we're going to ask health to drop the live feed. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that if anybody in this moment does not know you online or here, they'll just say, God, come into my life. Change me. Set me free. I realise that I belong to you and that you've got plans for me and you're never going to let me down. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, I just pray for the sick right now, those who are online, those who are in the house, that the power of the Holy Spirit will be all over us in these moments and that, Father, you would set the captives free and bring healing and deliverance in this moment in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us in Bible School. We'll be back here in two weeks' time and uh, we believe that God's going to bless you. Thanks. <laughs>